Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, I started to say everybody and everyone and got everyone. No, it didn't even sound like that. Okay, so uh, just a review of power and sample size analyses since we're going to be doing one in lab. And uh, I'm uh, basing uh, everything on the assumption that you reviewed chapter 8. Uh, from Gravetter and Warnow, or I assume it was Chapter 8, uh, the one about hypothesis, hypothesis testing, and then also uh, Price Chapter uh, 13, uh, the uh, hopefully your uh, research methods uh, textbook, and if you need to, there I have copies of them on Blackboard under Course Materials, and so. Again, review these two chapters and uh, hopefully you feel comfortable with these uh, topics. After the video lecture, you can go back and review the chapter to make sure you understand everything. So, uh, in general, the way that we do hypothesis testing is that we should set a null and alternative hypothesis. Uh, then we set the alpha level, and of course in psychology that is 0.05. Uh, Ronald Fisher came up with that about a hundred years ago and we're and we and a lot of other fields are sticking to it then we set our uh, power target that is for statistical power and uh, Cohen uh, suggests that we set it at least 0.8 uh, and what a 0.8 means in terms of statistical power statistical power is the probability of rejecting a false null hypothesis. Uh, so therefore, if the null hypothesis truly is false, we have, if it's 0.8, an 80% chance of rejecting it. Uh, if we set it, uh, our power at 0.95, we have a 95% chance of rejecting it if it's false, if it's false. Uh, then once we have those set, uh, we can calculate the sample size that we need to meet these targets, especially the target of power, uh, we basically have you know a lot of control over alpha level, uh, but it's still kind of in the mix when we're figuring out sample size. Uh, then we collect the data, and then we make conclusions. That is, we uh, do the inferential statistics. Uh, we go back to our uh, you know null and alternative hypotheses and our decision rule that we made and then we make a conclusion about whether we uh, re, you know, retain the null or uh, you know, uh, reject the null hypothesis. And of course the way it works, if we reject the null hypothesis, the only other alternative we have is the alternative hypothesis. Uh, looking at Gravetter and Wall now, I realize that they, in talking about the steps in hypothesis testing, uh, left out uh, the power and calculating the sample size. And I, I'm not surprised. Uh, you know, it's an introductory text. Uh, it's been <laughs> around forever. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I used Gravetter and Wallnow in the statistics uh, sa uh, sections I was teaching. Uh, so I'm really not surprised. But one of the things that we're trying to do in the last 20 years is to pay more attention to uh, issues such as uh, you know effect size, uh, you know power, and making sure that we uh, understand the sample size that we need to collect to meet the goal, uh, the targets that we have. Uh, so that's the only difference or the added thing in this class over uh, what we saw in Gravetter and Wallnow. Uh, Price, your methods textbook, does talk about some of these issues in that chapter, uh, which we'll be getting to in the next couple of weeks in lecture. So what this really means in terms of the actual way uh, researchers work is there's two ways that you can conduct a sample size analysis. One way is a priori, which in that's uh, Latin, and in the way that psychologists and uh, statisticians use that Latin means beforehand. We can conduct a sample size analysis beforehand before we do our research study. So we set our alpha level, our, we set the power level, uh, we estimate the error variance, 
uh, we do all the things that we need to do beforehand, and then we calculate the sample size to achieve the alpha level and the power level that we want. Then we collect the data and analyze the data and make a decision. And as I say here in the text box, this is the way research should be done. Uh, the researcher should set these values of power and estimate, you know, error variance and estimate effect size uh, beforehand, a priori, and then have a sample size which is an appropriate match to these values that they're interested in. And we'll be getting to why that's a problem uh, in a lecture section. And of course, the other method is post hoc, which means after the fact or after the experiment is done. Uh, you can, you know, in your experiment, collect the data and you have a certain sample size, a certain alpha level, uh, and then you'll just con uh, conduct a statistical analysis and determine significance there. Uh, then later on, you can calculate the effect size of your effect uh, you know, you'll know what the error variance is and you can calculate the power of your, uh, you know, test. Uh, this is the way that most research has been done. Uh, a lot, you know, back when I was in graduate school, uh, nobody ever bothered with a sample size analysis. And in social psychology, uh, you know, social psychologists are, of course, crazy about you know, a factorial design, uh, uh, between subjects factorial design. And so generally when you're doing a between subjects factorial design, uh, having 20 subjects per cell leads to a relatively uh, good power level and also, uh, you know, a good, you know, sample size. So we wouldn't really do a sample size analysis beforehand uh, you know, and really, 30 years ago, 35 years ago when I was in graduate school, we wouldn't do a, a power or a sample size analysis uh, post hoc either. Nobody just cared about that. But, as I say here, this leads to problems. And the main problem is p-hacking, which we'll talk about in class uh, in a couple of weeks. And so the reason, uh, this is the reason, the problems with p-hacking, as why we're doing a priori uh, sample size analyses now. So we can have a good idea of what power we're aiming for and based on estimates of the error variance and the power, uh, the uh, uh, effect size, what we do is we have a sample size that returns those types of, uh, you know, those levels of those variables. Uh, so to conduct an a priori sample size analysis, you need, of course, to set the alpha level, which you know I've already mentioned and you should know by now is 0.05 in psychology. Uh, the target power, Cohen says that 0.80 or 80% is the size that you want. And then the one thing you need left, uh, the one thing you have left is to estimate the effect size. Since this is a priori, you haven't done the experiment yet, so you have no way to know what your effect size is. And there are several ways that you can go about this. You can just guess, for example. And you can say, oh, I'm going to have a moderate effect size. And then you just plug that into the equation, whatever you know, rubric you're using, whatever variable you're using for effect size, you just uh, look up in the rubric table what a moderate effect size is and you plug that in. Uh, or you could be pessimistic and you can say, oh, we're going to have like a, a, you know, a very weak effect size. I've never done this experiment before, so really uh, I'm going to, you know, be pessimistic and say that there's really not going to be a strong effect. Or uh, you could take uh, an empirical approach and you could use the effect size from your pilot studies, if you have pilot studies, uh, or similar studies. Uh, that is, studies that ha are part of the research thread that you are working in, uh, studies that have been done by your lab in terms of programmatic research. Uh, these are all sources for 
uh, you know, estimating your effect size. Even if uh, your experiment hasn't been closely done before in terms of a replication or a converging replication, hopefully there are some things to go on. For example, uh, you could be using a very standard dependent variable measure, uh, such as a questionnaire or a survey, and you could look to see what the effect sizes of other researchers who have used that survey in other you know, types of research. So there's lots of examples on how you can go about finding your effect size. Uh, by the way, now that I'm mentioning effect size, I should talk about the plethora uh, of different effect size measures. And they're all for different types of data. And so we're going to be in this class focusing the most on eta squared and maybe a little bit of omega squared, but I'm keeping us on eta squared. Uh, and uh, Cohen's D, uh, because we're going to be doing t-tests and ANOVAs. And so this is the rubric chart I mentioned that is uh, a small effect size for, uh, you know, eta squared would be 0.01, a medium 0.06, and 14% would be a large effect size. And for Cohen's D, uh, 0 0.02, 0 0.05, and 0 0.08 are the rubric element, uh, the rubric points for a uh, small, medium, and large effect size using Cohen's D. Uh, so you could and possibly may have to use different measures of effect size to find out what your estimate is. For example, let's say that a lot of other research had been done using Cohen's D and they were finding effect sizes on average around 0.45. And then you're going to do a study, which is an ANOVA, and you can't use a Cohen's D uh, with ANOVA, uh, you know, well, or we're not going to worry about doing that. Uh, so you just say, well, that's a 0.45 is just below a, mo a medium effect size for a Cohen D, so just below a medium effect size for eta squared would be like uh, 0.05 or 0.055, something like that. So that's how you would use the rubric chart to estimate it. So uh, that is what I think you need. Oh, other examples. So as I said, you could always go to other research in your lab or pilot studies. And so here's a pilot study uh, using a uh, dependent variable, which is personal similarity. And uh, the partial eta squared is 0.077 uh, for the interaction, which is what the important effect is. So we could, given no other information, just say, OK, for my power and sample size analysis, I'm going to assume that the uh, you know, partial eta squared is 0 0.077. Or again, you could just go to uh, other journal articles. And so, for example, this one, partial eta squared is 0 0.07, uh, which, 0.08, excuse me, which is uh, kind of like a uh, moderate sized, or 0 0.03, which is kind of a small, you know, moderate to small size, uh, a little less than moderate. So you could just average those together and uh, come up with an average uh, eta squared. And then finally, if you find a meta-analysis, you're really in luck because meta-analyses, the way they work, the statistics that they do, is they actually, in a way, already sum up and average together effect sizes. And all you need to do is take all these effect sizes, and these are Cohen D's, it looks like, and uh, average them together, and then you would have uh, a good average effect size if you're working in a new field and, or doing an experiment for the first time and need to have an effect size for your power analysis. And uh, so how do you exactly do a power analysis? Uh, well, you can do it the hard way. Uh, here's my copy of Cohen. Uh, you know, and uh, it's, I haven't seen it in 
like <laughs> 17 months because it's in my office and I haven't been there that long. Uh, but uh, you know, you can work through the equations uh, in the uh, textbook. I mean, in uh, you know Cohen's book, and you work out the power for anything. Of course, we have things such as g power. Uh, and we're going to be using this for our lab, and that makes calculating uh, power uh, incredibly simple. In some ways, maybe too simple, uh, because anybody could do it without knowing what they're doing uh, and make mistakes. Uh, or we could use SPSS, and later on in the semester, we will be using SPSS, and we will be getting our uh, eta squares from SPSS. So. Uh, once you have the estimates, once you've already determined your power level, you just plug them in, literally plug them in uh, to something like G power or uh, you don't even have to, you know, or uh, SPSS, and they will tell you what your sample size should be. Uh, so that's the prep you need for the lab. Uh, the rest of the information is, uh, you know, in the lab assignment and also on the internet about G power if you need it. Uh, but maybe you won't because G power is so easy. Uh, that's it. Uh, just to remind you about what a type 1 and type 2 error is, I think this is pretty funny. So I'll see you in lab. Bye-bye.